काम आप करे आप अपने मुल्क को इन चोरों के हवाले हमारा लीडर इमरान खान सच के साथ करे This is a very hectic entrance to Imran Khan's residency here in Lahore right now, and as you can see, there's a lot of people that have shown up. All these people are supporters of his. Why are you outside his house right now? Without difficulty, the government, important government, important government has arrived here to arrest him. So you're protecting Imran Khan against arrest? Yes, yes, yes. Protecting Imran Khan. There is a chance. We are fighting for Imran Khan. Inshallah, we will die for him. Inshallah. Why? Because he is the original leader of Islamic and all over the world. Imran Khan, the man at the center of Pakistan's political chaos right now, from cricketing hero to prime minister to an ousted opposition leader fighting for survival. And they want me in jail so that I cannot contest elections. Imran Khan has been kicked out of government just last year. He's now hoping to make a political comeback. Things are very, very tense. The police have been camped outside his house, and we're heading right into the belly of the beast to meet the man himself. It is a very interesting time in Pakistan at the moment. Right outside your house, there's been police who came to try and arrest you just last night. Around them are all your supporters that we just passed coming in here today. How does it feel to be in the middle of this firestorm? What I always hoped one day would be my my people being politically aware, understanding what true freedom is. The demand in Pakistan is for real freedom, which means justice, which means fundamental rights. In my 26 years of politics, it's the first time I feel that people realize that they want true freedom. 30 years ago, you were one of the greatest cricket players of all time. You were a national hero, a captain for this country. Did you know you were going to be prime minister of this country? No, it was never my ambition because I was focused completely on cricket. I played 21 years of international cricket. And when I went into politics, it was a, the biggest challenge. And I would not have gone there had I not already gone through the mill in my life of facing ups and downs. Three and a half years in as a prime minister was the most difficult thing I'd ever done because our country was bankrupt. But you never look back in life because people ask me, you know, you had such a great glamour life as a cricketer. I look upon that life and, you know, I don't even remember it. It's, it means nothing to me. Really? There's not a tiny part of you that misses it? So many people will remember you from, you know, being splashed across the Daily Mail. My mum's a big fan. You know, you were a total babe magnet. You don't miss that life of free of responsibility Never. at all? Not even, not even once have I ever <laughs> missed that life. In fact, I don't even watch any cricket anymore. It is time for fresh faces to come into Pakistani politics. Since bursting into politics in 1996 and being elected prime minister in 2018, the challenges facing Imran Khan have been enormous. Just a few months back, Khan was leading a rally when he was shot three times in the leg. What was it like for you, knowing that someone is shooting at you? Well, I was, I was expecting uh, an attempt on my life, and I had predicted that for two months. When I heard the gunshots, I thought they were firecrackers. And, but then I had this uh, you know, awful feeling in my right leg. I had uh, three bullets in my left leg, and one of them had broken my bone but it also had damaged my nerve in my foot. But even when I was lying down, I thanked the Almighty because I knew I was saved. And what about now? I mean, are you, are you scared? Well, uh, I mean, uh, the threat of uh, assassination is, is probably even more now than before because the three people who I knew were responsible for this, they're still sitting in power. And they are probably more worried now than ever before because all indications are that whenever there are elections, my party is going to sweep the elections. Despite Khan's finger pointing at the current government, there's no evidence that the ruling party was behind the assassination attempt. But they have pushed back the date for the next elections and filed dozens of legal cases against him, which is widely seen as an attempt to prevent him from running again. You are facing some very serious legal charges right now. There's a possibility that could lead to a prison sentence. The corruption cases against me. There's just one what they're saying. When you get public gifts in Pakistan, they are saying that I sold, sold one of the gifts. So 
uh, I want a public hearing about this. I want this to be in public, covered by the media when this case comes to court. How would you handle prison? I survived an attempt, I'm really lucky to be alive. So I mean, prison is, uh, will be, I guess when it comes to it, I'll go to it. But if I don't fight for my country, who will? A few days after this interview was filmed, the violence escalated. One supporter was killed, and when the police unsuccessfully tried to arrest Khan at his home, two full days of chaos ensued. You're fighting for political survival. You are telling your people to go out on the streets, to march, to go to jail for you. You're calling for early elections. You say that your priority is economic and political stability. Do you ever think that if you were to step aside, if you were to let go, the government could get on with running the economy? If the current government was worried about economic stability, why did they conspire to remove our government? We only had one and a half years left. So why, what was the hurry? The prime minister was about to be convicted. His sons were about to be convicted on billions of rupees of corruption. So the hurry was they didn't want to remove the government because there was a problem with the economy or they were worried about inflation. They wanted to remove the government because they wanted to get rid of the corruption cases, which they did. You came into power promising to eradicate corruption within six months. You haven't done that. Corruption perception index worsened during your rule. The problem in Pakistan is that we have what is called elite capture. The ruling elite is above law. So it's not just Pakistan's problem, it's the problem with the entire developing world. My whole campaign is to bring the powerful crooks under the law. And why I failed, unfortunately, because the National Accountability Bureau, which deals with corruption, was not under me, was under the army chief. So you're saying you don't have control over the military? Because the army chief had the veto, I could not get the powerful crooks convicted, which is why we could not improve on our corruption index. If you cannot bring the powerful under the rule of law and hold them accountable, then I'm afraid, how can you control corruption? You've been very critical of the current government for suppressing free speech, for politically persecuting you, as you say. Under your own government, talk shows were shut down, journalists who've been critical of you were attacked, tortured, detained. As someone who is presenting yourself as a victim, I can see you shaking your head, as someone who is presenting yourself as a victim of persecution and a beacon of free speech. Not one case against the media was ever instituted by my government. I mean, there is, there is a long no, list no, of journalists on, no, no. who... Uh, let, let me just complete it. So not one by my government. What happened was the journalist who got into trouble said something to the army. When I found out, immediately the next day we had them released. Compare that to what's going on now. That might be true, uh, but I'm going to ask you about killed. under your rule. You know, the Reporters my, Without Borders said that, you know, labeled you as a press freedom predator. The, the two times we found out two journalists were picked up, we immediately took action. And what about the others? There were people who were shot outside their homes. There were people whose talk shows were shut down. Talk shows were shut down on only on two people who apparently said something against the army, not against my government. The army has ruled Pakistan for half the country's existence, and critics accuse them of still pulling the strings in the country's politics. You blame the military for many things. Why should people vote for you if you can't control the military? My responsibility was fighting corruption, but I did not have the authority on the institution that was supposed to be a tool to fight corruption, NAB, which was controlled by the army chief. Do you not feel like it needs to be dismantled in order to actually have a free and fair country, as you say? There, there needs to be a balance. No management system works if the prime minister has the responsibility, but he doesn't have the authority. Another force Khan has tried to find balance with is the Taliban. We must strengthen this current government, stabilize it for the sake of the people of Afghanistan. Nicknamed Taliban Khan, he's known for his softer approach to the group. When the Taliban took Afghanistan, you noted that the Taliban had promised to uphold human rights and to form an inclusive government. It's been 
two years now and the Taliban does not have an inclusive government. The human rights record is not looking good, especially for, for women's rights, as I'm sure you're aware. Is there any part of you that regrets a somewhat softer attitude towards the Taliban? You see, unfortunately, in the West, all you look upon Afghanistan is Taliban and anti-Taliban. We in Pakistan look upon Afghanistan as our neighbor and after 40 years, for the first time, there's peace in Afghanistan. Now, what I said was, the Western countries must get them into the mainstream. Because the more you mainstream them, the more influence you would have in enforcing human rights. But if you isolate them, what leverage has any country got left now to tell them to send your girls to school or, or human rights? You can't. But human rights are suffering. We visited Afghanistan after the Taliban takeover, and witness firsthand the erosion of women's rights. Now that the Taliban are fully back in control, we're getting a lot of very disapproving stares from uh, people for being the only women in here. So what kind of guidelines are you giving people for in terms of how they should be living here? <laughs> Can you understand, you know, why international communities of the West can't be sending so much money and can't be recognizing the Taliban government if, you know, they're not allowing girls to go to school, they're not allowing women to, to work, they're not allowing women in public spaces? But my point is that is this an effective way of uh, trying to influence Afghanistan by, by condemning them and ordering them and isolating them? The question asked by the Western countries, what should be their interest? a stable government in Afghanistan, there shouldn't be any international terrorism. But if you isolate them, why would they listen to anyone? That's my only point. Khan says the dire situation for women in Afghanistan will not benefit from the world's isolation. But what about the women in his own country? There's a strong movement of young Pakistani women at the moment who are fighting for gender equity in this country. Do you support those Pakistani feminists in their fight for gender equity? Absolutely. Yeah. Look, and Pakistan is very fortunate in a lot of ways when you compare what is going on, you know, in other countries. I mean, you know, we have uh, a woman twice became prime minister. But you say that, I mean, women are in a good situation then in Pakistan, but why did you have so few of them in your top brass when you were in government? Well, it's a merit system. I mean... I mean, you look, had one of the worst records of female representation over the last few governments. Yeah, but you know, look, you want a system of merit. In the U.S., you haven't had a woman prime minister, uh, uh, a president so far. The point is that you select a cabinet on merit, people who are going to deliver. If you do get back into power, will you work to improve that record? No, it's not a question. Look, if you, when you come into power, your number one priority is to deliver to the people, give, give them governance. So to give them governance, you need the best people in the best ministries. And there aren't good women? So, so if they are, like Shirin Mazari, one of our most powerful ministers, you know, you don't just fill in spaces just because of quotas, because in the end, the people are going to ask you, we expected you to deliver, you know, what is your result? Khan doesn't just see himself as a champion of women's rights, but also as a staunch defender of Muslims around the world. A record that's also been called into question. I've covered human rights for a decade. The worst human rights atrocity that I've ever covered is the repression of Muslim Uyghurs in China. There is so much disappointment amongst the Uyghur community that leaders of Muslim countries, including yourself, have not spoken out to condemn these actions. Does it grate on you at all that you haven't been able to speak out? Look, Isabel, the problem is there's Imran Khan as a human rights activist. I used to speak about everything, not just Muslims. You know, wherever there was discrimination and uh, human rights abuse, I would speak up against it. When you become the prime minister, your number one priority becomes, in my case, 220 million people of Pakistan. When that is your number one priority, then you have to be very careful. You don't have yeah. the luxury to criticize. Poor countries do not have the luxury to criticize when they have a huge amount of uh, vulnerable people. Rich countries, unfortunately, they too are selective. But China isn't the only country Khan refuses to criticize. Who's the prime minister? He happened to be visiting Russian President Vladimir Putin the very day he invaded Ukraine. What was Putin like that day? You got a front row seat to 
war breaking out and him literally launching war that day? Well, the morning, just before, an hour before my meeting, we found that they had invaded Ukraine. So I first thought he might cancel the meeting. Then I thought it would be a brief meeting. I didn't think I would be sitting there for three hours. Did you bring it up with him? And he gave the Russian point of view. Why didn't the West include Russia in NATO? Why is this alliance against Russia? And why at the doorstep? So he had his point of view. Of course, the West has their own point of view. My point is that, you know, we as countries should stay neutral. We became part of the US war on terror. 80,000 Pakistanis were killed. Over $100 billion were lost to the economy. There were 400 drone attacks by the US on an ally in Pakistan. And what did we gain out of this? One lesson Pakistan has learned is stay out of other people's conflicts. Are you enjoying this fight? Yes, because I think uh, if I woke up and there was no challenge in my life, I would think it's the end of my life. So there's never a point you're going to step aside? I don't know, because right now I see this huge challenge in front of me. So I'm just focused on that. What happens after that? I don't know. Get Pakistan out of this quagmire is, uh, is going to be probably the most phenomenal thing that um, anyone could ever do.